Good afternoon. I'm talking to um, Barry Mayer here from Mayer's Rist in um, De Rist in um, near Oetsuring. Um Barry, you've done our regenerative agriculture and that for quite a while. Um, you've got a fascinating story. If you can just give us a bit of your context. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you here this afternoon. I think we've had an excellent day and a half on the farm with you looking around. And um, I really appreciate that you enjoyed it. And I really like some of the inputs I got from you. I mean, you're a world of knowledge. And I so appreciate that you're actually making this video to help other farmers move away from conventional farming into regenerative farming, which not only is good for the environment, but I think is good for each of our pockets as well. I think it's a, it's a wonderful way to save money. Um, I grew up on a sugarcane farm in Zululand and ended up here in Oatsworn on the military and then went overseas for a very long time and was always in love with this area and bought this farm. And it's a beautiful farm lay in the hills here. And um, the problem was with the farm for me is I could not get the soil to take water. And I think coming from where I come, I looked at chemicals that I could add to the soils to make them more porosity in the soils and it really just didn't uh, and at the time um, looking at that I came across um, Ray Archuleta being interviewed by Buzz Clute while they were standing in a hole and explaining about how roots work and things like that and how deep roots go and I think Ray just really resonated with me he just seemed like such a nice man and he worked for the um, Conservation Corps, which is part of the USDA. And I thought, hell, you know, I mean, this guy really has a story to tell, you know, and there's a different way of skinning this cat. And that got me on to Gabe Brown. And I think, as you know, he's a very dynamic speaker. And then I got into listening to some of the stuff of Joel Saladin, which is a, a little bit of a different take on it but still very interesting to me. And um, I think then I listened to him, some other stuff from Buzz Clute, and I thought, hell, you know, this guy's South African, which at the time I didn't realize. And I think as you start doing this stuff, then you start learning about cover crops and how this can impact the soil. And then of course I came across this amazing lady um, called Elaine Ingham. And I think Elaine had a massive impact on me. I mean, she really, explained why it's important to have bacteria in the soil. And from that, I realized that, hey, you know, there are basically four principles to make agriculture work, okay? The first one is you really need to absolutely minimize the soil disturbance, and you should preferably not apply any chemicals to your soils, okay? There's really no need for us if we farm with nature to add chemicals to our soil. The second one is, of course, we need to have cover on the ground at all times, and there should be greenery on top of the ground. And the third one is, we always should have a, a mixed crop. We should no, have no monocultures. Monocultures are just not conducive to a natural way of farming, where nowhere in nature do you go and find um, a monoculture. And then fourthly is um, you need to have animals incorporated into your farming um, in order, to, the animals are walking biodigesters in the ca name of, uh, in, in cattle, and these cattle basically leave bacteria on the soil, which just really um, mimics what basically happened in the old days when we had huge herds of wild animals walking across Africa and not coming back for some time. I mean, we still have that on the Serengeti where we have these huge migrations. And it's very important that our fields get a rest and then are heavily grazed and then they get a rest again to rejuvenate themselves. And that's what we're trying to mimic on my farm. And it has worked really well for me. Um, one of my major constraints is for the last seven years We've had a significant drought. Um, our average rainfall here is about 380 millimeters. This year, we've actually done really well. We've had 300 millimeters this year. Last year, we had 286. 
The year before that, I can't quite remember the number, but it was significantly lower. And we could hardly farm. I mean, we really had to reduce our livestock numbers down to where I have about 65 um, mothers, uh, female cows, and then I have all their calves at the moment. So we're over, we're right at about 120 animals. And um, it, it seems to be working for us very well. Um, the farm has changed very much. There's a lot of greenery around. And obviously, if we can get to a situation where we can come up with another 100 millimeters, it would just really make a huge difference for us. Just to, um, on your context, where you are actually, um, uh, is the mountainous terrain and the, and the how dry it actually is. This farm used to be an ostrich farm, am I correct? It was, yes. Yeah. And I mean, that is degraded soil, so that is what you've built up, what was your, that was your starting block. Yes, and I, I, um, I guess I, I found inspiration from um, Walter Jenna, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that somewhere you'll explain who he is. And he calls it pedogenesis, uh, the building of topsoil, which I've actually looked up in the dictionary. The word doesn't seem to exist. So I don't know if Walter made that up somewhere, but I love the word. And that's really what I'm doing on my farm. I'm building topsoil. Mm. And um, it's essential. The one thing that all farmers have in common is topsoil. And um, there are significant studies that have been peer reviewed that show that we lose about um, one millimeter of topsoil per year if we are doing conventional farming. And if we go back historically, we know that the Fertile Crescent was a very rich area with high rainfall and amazing farming. But the plow, of course, caused a lot of disturbance. And um, over the years, basically that civilization lasted till the topsoil was gone. and um, David Montgomery actually writes in a book, he wrote, wrote a book, Dirt, where he writes about the um, ancient, the, I think it's the Romans, the Mesopotamians, um, where they, the, the Inca, I think, are part of it, where the empires collapsed because of the loss of topsoil. Exactly. I mean, and one of the ones that I've always wondered about was the Anastasi Indians in northern New Mexico, where I have gone to where they lived, and they're a kilometers and kilometers of canals, but no water. Mm. So what actually happened? And my personal feeling is that in these instances, a lot of it has to do, you have an agrarian society, and then you have bare soil. And then once you have bare soil, you have drought. And then they convert to animal husbandry. And then animal husbandry does the rest of it, and it really turns it into a desert. And it really, I think, a lot of our problems with climate change actually have to do with overgrazing and not giving the land enough time to re rejuvenate itself. So the crux of the matter here is we have to somehow rehydrate the soils. And once we can rehydrate the soils, I believe that that'll bring back rain. Just on your topsoil quote, we lose three and a half tons of topsoil for every ton of maize we produce in South Africa. That it's, is, that is our. I think that's an official. That's the. I think that's even peer reviewed. I mean, I, if you, if you look at that number, it's really a frightening number. Yes. I mean, I mean, how long are we going to be able to sustain this? Mm. But there is a solution, and the solution is regenerative agriculture. I mean, if you took those maize fields and you planted cover crops amongst the maize, I mean, it just has to stop. Mm. I mean, we have to change the way we, we are farming and we have to look more towards nature in how we farm. And I, and I don't know how to put that more succinctly. You've done quite a bit of work. Um, you also had cl uh, canals on this farm, and that that you, with the, your whole program of re um, hard, what's it re rehydrating, hydrating your farm, and that. Do you want to go a bit into that as well? Okay, of course, yes. So we've obviously had a terrible drought. Okay, and the option was there to start drilling holes in the ground. Okay, for borehole water. 
But I really, um, I'm not really sure that I want to do that. It, it, I have some discomfort with actually drilling holes and taking water from, from below the surface. Especially when I consider the, the kind of rainstorms we've been having is that we have in the last you know, 10 years had several rainstorms that were more than 100 millimeters in a couple hours. And there is more water that runs off my farm during a rainstorm than what I probably consume in a whole year. Okay, and if you think about that persp in perspective, it's a little bit frightening. So all over the farm, the old people had canals. I mean, that basically captured water that came off the mountain and led it into dams. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm going back into those canals and I'm digging them out, okay, in order to capture more water, okay. So when water falls on my farm, I want more of that water to stay on my farm, okay, um, in terms of, and what I found with these canals, because they're very, very flat, is the water will sit in them and within three or four days, the water will be percolating out the bottom of the canal onto the ground as pure clean water and then just sinking into the ground. I need to have more of that. That is, that, that is I think, my next step in order to, um, to improve the quality of my farm um, is we need to control surface runoff. And that fits in quite well with, I think, the designs of key line farming. And I, and I think that is a subject that um, they do believe in some plowing, um, ripping, and I'm a little uncomfortable with that. But I don't have an issue at all with um, making some canals and letting the water stay and sink in. One of the advantages, of course, that I don't think that we've discussed here right now is that if you are regeneratively farming, for every kilogram of carbon that you can put in the soil, your soil will hold seven kilograms of water, mm. okay? So already I can tell you that when we have storms is the holding capacity of the fields that are being farmed regeneratively is so enormous that that has made a huge change. Is in the beginning here, when I started this, if I had five millimeters of rain, three of it ran off. Yeah. When did you start? What year did you actually so, start? Um, I've been at this now for six years. So this is my sixth year. So, so you actually I, started in the, in, in the drought. <laughs> yes, there was a real motivation to try and find something that works better than what I was doing. And I think <clears throat> for the first three years I was on the, or four years I was on the farm, we had so much rain that I couldn't use all the water. It was actually running off the farm. Mm. And then uh, it's about seven, Eight years ago, we started, we had a, in 2014 is actually the exact year, we had um, a massive flood that year. We had a flood through the port. We had 100 millimeters of rain in, a, in the 13th and 14th of July, excuse me, 13th and 14th of January. And then it just stopped raining. And ever since, we've really not had much rain. Um, we've had no events that have given us more than 30 millimeters of rain. Since 2014? Yes, yeah. And that's scary. It's frightening. It's beyond yeah. scary. It's actually really frightening, actually. How many hectares? You, then, you started, I mean, you're doing cover crops and you're doing pasture, um, planted pasture for your cattle. Yes, I do. How many hectares have you got currently? Um, I've got about 25 hectares that are under irrigation and under pasture at the moment, yeah. How long are, do your cattle... Do they go on to felt or natural felt grazing as well? Um, last year we did for about a month. I basically just had to sacrifice. Um, we had in February, March last year, we had a time when we just did not have enough rain or there wasn't enough water to keep the pastures um, wet. Right. So I just put the cattle on the felt, but because the felt hadn't really been grazed, I think that month that I had them all did very little damage. Um, I didn't... It's, it's a really hard decision. I think a lot of farmers face this decision, is that when you start having a drought, do I keep my animals or sell them and it rains next week? And so instead of having that argument with myself, I said, okay, these animals will be okay on the felt for a month. Mm. 
But if this month goes by and I don't see any improvement, then I need to sell animals. And fortunately, you know, within 10 days, it started raining. So, but the animals were so fat on the felt that I thought, hell, I'm just going to leave them there for another 20 days. You had a fire here in 2016, 17. Yes, 2016, we had a fire. It started on the 15th of December and it was out on the 23rd of December. Um, it burned from uh, close to the Kango Caves and it burned all the way over to Prince Albert, then to Klarstrom and back over to my farm. And unfortunately, the day that it was, we, that it was, we sort of had it out, we had this massive windstorm and it just, we couldn't stop the fire. I mean, my wife actually saved this little house that we're sitting in right now. She loaded all the furniture that's in this building right now on one pickup truck load. And when she had to bring it back up, she brought it back up on four pickup truck <laughs> loads. <laughs> and then she climbed on the roof with a hose and decided she's not gonna lose this building. And she literally, she did save this building. So yeah, it was quite an, exp it, it, it is, a feeling that I cannot really um, explain to anybody. And so these farmers who've had these massive fires here the last couple of weeks, I have no idea how they feel. I mean, I, I just, it's something that's undescribable. Yeah, it's devastating. It is totally, yeah. And unfortunately, then we didn't, haven't really had rain. And so a lot of the felt hasn't grown back, but finally this year, we're seeing some improvement. And we're seeing that the water holding capacity of the mountain is coming back a little bit. So we have quite a bit more water this year than last year, and just because of the water holding capacity of the mountain. Just to put it into context again, you, just, uh, because just to repeat it, you farm on 25 hectares, you farm 65 animals. Yes. 365 days a year. I do, yes. Because I mean, I think that is, that's quite phenomenal actually. Yeah. That people don't realize, and I mean, your animals aren't thin. Yeah. They all in calf, or they all have a calf next to them yes. as well. And I mean, uh, so I mean, it's, it's it's quite an achievement. Yeah, but it can be done, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's no, just, fair enough. Yeah, and I think so. So that's where I mean, I I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, but that's where we start talking about a pasture that's not a monoculture. Okay, and that's where, I mean. Uh, Christine Jones, Jones comes in. I mean, I, I think anybody who farms should, should go and listen to Christine Jones. I mean, sh she's made such an amazing contribution here where she's talking about you need to have at least 14 species of plants in your pasture. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting. They've changed that again to four. Okay. That you actually just need the four classes. Okay, four classes. Four okay. classes, yeah. Um, okay. Um, but it's but which is interesting because I think the um, I mean if you speak to the cover crop guys where they often say don't um, it's all fine and well planting 14 species but not all of them come up or you can't just put 14 grasses down right. you've got to actually have the four classes of um, a few legumes grasses brassicas um, and I always forget the fourth one but anyway it doesn't yeah. actually matter but, okay um, grasses brassicas and legumes yeah, yeah. Okay, so we plant those classes, and then I have a mixture of each one. Okay, so in my grasses in the winter, I like ryegrass, and I plant a little bit of both tetraploid and diplodoid. Okay, and then I plant um, tetracale, uh, barley, and oats. And I really actually like um, cereal rye because it grows quite tall, mm. and um, it, it makes... and. It's not important that everything doesn't come up, okay? There's a little bit of everything growing. I mean, in, the, in my brassicas, I plant um, Japanese radishes, Austrian radish, Austrian, um, uh, excuse me, Australian radish, the, the purple top, and I plant um, kale, and, and that stuff, it doesn't, and, and white mustard. And there's always a little bit of it around. It's mm. quite amazing. There's not huge amounts of it, so it's, it's dispersed, and I, as a farmer, cannot that easily quantify um, how well it's working, but I have to tell you that when I look at my cows, I like the result. And whether I plant four species or 14 species, it doesn't actually cost that. The cost difference yeah, the cost is, is, is yeah. because I basically end up mixing it all together in any case. Mm. You've got a fascinating 
and um, I'm going to come to your compost thing and your seed treatment before you actually plant, if you want to go into that, because I think that's, Elaine talks a lot about it a lot, um, but if you can talk about your compost system and also your seed treatment and that before you actually do plant. Yes, so Elaine Ingham says that we can grow um, ryegrass that is 1.2 meters tall without it going to seed, okay. That would be quite an achievement, okay? That's the kind of stuff as a farmer that you dream of, okay? Because, I mean, my ryegrass doesn't probably get more than about um, 12 inches on my farm, which is 30 centimeters. And um, so Elaine, unfortunately, is a very complex person um, in terms of um, when you try and get information from her. You know, when I read her stuff, I get what she's saying. But I found that there was that that David Johnson and his wife Sue, David and Sue Johnson, and he, they're they're much more their videos are more approachable. And I would really recommend anybody watch these. He explains why it works and how it works. So he designed a composting system, um, and he was a fellow, I think, at the um, New Mexico State University, and he's now at Chico State in California. And David basically was making compost the conventional way. And his wife got tired of washing his clothes and he came up with a different system. And it basically is a small system and it makes enough for about 230 hectares uh, of, of composting for on about 230 30 hectares. And it's a very simple system where you basically take mesh and you put compost in it and there are pipes and you remove the pipes and once it's gone through the thermophilic stage you add worms to it and you let it sit for a year and it has bacteria in it but it becomes functionally dominant okay so what you so then what i do with that material is i take for every 50 kilograms of seed that i plant i take 10 liters of compost i add hot milk to it and a tablespoon of um, molasses and then I actually mix my seed my 50 kilograms of seed in that okay and then I take that whole batch that I've all mixed up now and I put it in my planter and I plant this wet stuff and I mean my logic said to me this is never going to work but actually it just flows beautifully Mm. And I do generally have an employee stand on the back and just make sure that it is feeding uh, in case it bridges. But I mean, we very seldom have a problem with it bridging. Um, we don't use an air seeder. Uh, I should say that we use a free flow seeder. Um, and of course, I mean, we don't have that much hectareage, so I really don't justify such a large seeder. Yes. And then um, it has, it creates a situation, according to David, where this compost around this moisture and bacteria around the seed tells the seed listen you're in a great environment here you need to germinate mm. and i just think when i look at my ground that we're getting amazing germination we're only planting about 25 to 30 kilograms of seed every time we plant yet we're getting huge amounts of and basically um, if i exclude the the um the tiff we're planting about um 10 to 12 million seeds per hectare. I mean, that's a lot of seed if yes. you really think about it. And I, and I think that's one of these we really need to consider is how much are we planting? Um, we should probably be even cutting down a little bit on that seed count. And I think you can if you're using a good quality compost like that, you know, that's recommended by David and Sue Johnson. And it's such a simple system to build, doesn't cost hardly anything. And there's so little maintenance of it. You give it a minute of water every day and... You also, you don't use any inorganic fertilizer? No, do you um, no, I don't at all. Um, I, just, I just don't see the need. And if I look at, um, you obviously want to talk a little bit about Fruit Look here. When I look at um, my Fruit Look results, I don't actually see any need for that. And if I look at, the cows, I also don't see a need to add phosphates and things like that because I think that if you can reestablish the fungi under the ground, that they will in fact 
bring the phosphates into the plants, and um, you will, which is a basic building block, of course, for healthy animals. And I think my animals are very healthy. Mm. And I just don't see the need. And of course, I see that in the last month, um, nitrogen has gone from um, yeah, I mean, I almost a 40% increase yeah. in price. The phosphates, as far as I know, the phosphates, all, the energy cost in Europe or in, um, in international energy costs are just, they aren't stripping the, the value of the, uh, of the inorganic fertilizers. It's just becoming too expensive. Yeah, and, and I think that... The manufacturing it, of it. Exactly. I mean, it takes so much energy to make nitrogen that um, why don't we just use the plants to make nitrogen with us and give them the bacteria and the fungi. And I think even we can meet the demands of a yield in terms of a good yield in maize possibly by doing this. I mean, there are farmers who are doing it. And even in the beginning, if you have to sacrifice some yield, just the cost benefit will probably outweigh. Mm. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping that the, the, the way we are farming right now, farmers will realize this is just becoming too expensive to farm the way. We need to turn back to nature a little bit. Mm. I mean, that's what this whole series is about. Yeah. To I, a certain I, extent, yeah. I mean, it's, I think when you farm this way and you're not using chemicals, I think every day you think about um, what am I going to be keeping alive today? It's not what I'm going to kill every day. Mm. And I, that's not my own quilt. I mean, that's actually from Gabe Brown. He says, when I used to farm conventionally, I'd get up every day, what am I going to kill today? <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting, and, it, and you've said it now quite often, is the yield. And it's, it's not necessarily about the yield. It's about the profit that they make. Exactly. And it's the input costs, and that's just a fact on farming internationally as well. The input costs have doubled. And the profit margins have halved. So we have to look at alternatives because that trend isn't going to stop with conventional agriculture. So, I mean, today we're probably looking at, at a cost of chemicals at close to 50 to 55% mm. of your gross profit. And I just think that can't be good. Mm. And just in increases your risk. Yeah, and I mean, you're, you're, always, you're always having to pay somebody. Mm. You touched a little bit on, on fruit look. The, the program. Um, can you actually just explain that a bit? Yes, um, it's a program that the um, Western Cape government is paying for, okay, and uh, it's an amazing program. It's for free to the farmers of the Western Cape, and every seven days they have a company that flies a satellite over the Western Cape and and basically photographs all the farms with some system um, that I think it's infrared, and then they, from that, they can do certain anal analytical things that help the farmer. And in my case, is I can see on my farm exactly how much biomass increased that week, how much evaporation there was. So I can actually schedule my grazing according to it. I can actually schedule my irrigation according to it. And there are also leaf indexes that you can use, and it has the ability to tell me how much nitrogen is in the top of my plant and in the whole plant. And this program is, is field specific, and the pixel area is about a 10 meter by 10 meter. So this is an absolutely incredible tool that I think each farmer in the Western Cape should use on their farms, whether you are running pastures or grapes, and at the moment, there are about 300 users, but we'd really like to see more people using it because it's an amazing program. And um, it just can make such a difference. I mean, I schedule all my irrigation based on that, and it is totally approved when you get audited, when they look at your irrigation, that it's an approved system for you to do your, your irrigation based on that. Just about in regarding to the context as well, and I think what that's, but some people, um, if they don't know where Otsurung or Darist is, and that, that you're in the Karoo. I'm in the Klein Karoo. In the Klein Karoo, but yeah, still. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's, it's what is it, semi-arid? Yes, it'd be semi-arid, and we, of course, are in a winter rainfall area. But more and more, we're seeing that we're actually getting a bit of rain between November and January as well. Um, I don't think that that was traditionally that way. 
thousand years ago maybe it was that way, but not in our lifetimes. It's not really been that way. But that makes a big difference at the moment. Last year that made a huge difference to me. Mm. Have you got a 10 year running average on your rainfall? I actually have more than that, yes. Okay, and? It's about 380 millimeters a year. Is it getting average. less? Much, much less, yes. Is it? Yeah, and we're actually looking potentially, if you look at some of the statistics and predictions, that we're going to have another 30% less rainfall in the next 30 years. When I was here in the military, I used to go visit in Van Veeksdorp, and there were lots of little pastures and little farms with little bit of lucerne and sheep and things like that. And people were making a good living. But by the time I bought my farm, there was nothing happening there. I mean, it's all gone. And then when I actually came to live here in 2010, 11, um, suddenly there was no farming really going on between Oatsworn and Carlitz Dorp. I mean, it was just becoming an arid desert. And the frightening thing is in the last seven years, that drought has brought the desert right here to Durrest. Mm. I mean, if you drive from here to Oatsworn, there are just very few places that actually produce crops in the last seven years. It's a bit frightening, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is, yeah. But it's, it is, and it's, I mean, it's, I think that's where regenerative agriculture really does come in is how do we, and it's, you say, you've said it earlier on already, where it, it really has to do with your carbon. We have to increase the carbon in our soil, um, and the carbon that we put in through, um, what's it, photosynthesis, yes. and sequestra uh, carbon sequestration through the living root, is which, it's, it's a much, uh, the bacteria bind it much, for much longer than compost does, compost burns again. Exactly. So, so the compost for me is just a carrier for putting bacteria in mm. the soil. So what happens is that the plant takes, takes the, car the, the carbon from the oxygen and spins the oxygen off and then um, puts that in the ground, okay? Mm. And the bacteria consume that carbon and they also trade it off yes. to the fungi. And the fungi, of course, trade back um, phosphates um, to, the, to the bacteria, which is to the benefit of the plant. Yeah, and I so mean, there's so this major yeah. symbiotic relationship under mm. there. The question is, how do we rehydrate the Klenkarua? And that, I think, is a bit more complex of a question. At least I have some rainfall, and what regenerative agriculture has done for me is it's made the rain go much further. Mm. But it's that is, and I think that is what it's about: is to make the rain go further. Yes. And not only here; it's 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 across Africa. Exactly. It's not it's not only here. It's I mean, yeah, we have to make the if the rainwater runs off your farm, it's got no use to you. And it's interesting. One of the great motivators to me is John Liu. Is that how you say his name? John Liu. Yeah. Uh, John Liu. John Liu. Liu. Yeah. And that's where you and I met at Speed, mm. and he was. In, the video that he made of this, the loose plateau in China that was, I mean, converted from a desert back to a green area, mm. all had to do with stopping the runoff of water. Yes. From the I mean, there's, a, there's a saying, what we owe our, <coughs> regardless of your accomplishments, we owe our existence to six inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Exactly. And that is what it's about. So yes. we have to look after our topsoil and we have to look after our. Our, um, that the water actually gets in. And what the people don't understand, I think, as well to a big extent, is that most biological sim um, signaling and that actually happens in topsoil. It's our biggest living organism. Yes, it or, is. Or uh, system. And uh, for too long, we've actually looked at the chemistry and not at the biology. We have to go back to the biology. Exactly. Yeah. And, so, so, and that's what they did on the loose plateau. And yes. I, I would really recommend anybody... Um, please watch the video yes. on the loose plateau. It makes such an impact. And it it's sort of the digging of the canals that I'm doing on the farm actually has a little bit to do with that. Yes. In that I've realized that when I watch those videos that you need to keep the water on your farm and reestablish on the mountainsides, have trees grow back, 
mm. have more trees in my fields. There's nothing wrong with having, you just plant around them. Yeah. You just got to make sure that you plant them in such a way that you can plant around them, that's all. Mm. I think that's what makes permaculture and so interesting as well, is how do you and how they build their canals to actually zigzag on the contour line the water so that the water really runs off as slowly as possible off the land, off your land. Especially being in the mountains as I am, I think that is a very, very important thing. And after the fire, I mean, we've had a lot more runoff than ever before. Mm. So there isn't that, that slow release that you get out of the mountains. So, I mean, this is going to be my first summer with the canals. So we'll see what they do this year. Um, and my hope is that they will really help rehydrate the soils and start having the streams flow again. I mean, the streams haven't flown on my farm for since the 1940s. Yeah. And that's, that's terrible. Because I know that my neighbor used to have an eight hour Leibert out of the stream that flows past this little house a week uh, in the 1940s, but he hasn't used it since the 1948, I think. Yeah, it's, you know, it is frightening. Yeah, I mean, so, so there's a lot of change going on. And I mean, and obviously, I, I think that a lot of the change that is happening is nature itself, okay? But one has to acknowledge that we have increased the amount of carbon in the atmosphere in the last 40 years. I mean, at an enormous rate. I mean, when President Carter went to the... Um, the Scripps Institute in San Diego and say, oh, you know, this increase that Keaton's talk, Keeling, Keaton is his name? Keeling, Keeling, is talking about from 280 parts per million. What is the impact going to be to the United States? You know, they came back and they said, well, there is going to be an impact. And that was the beginning of the IPCC. But they also talked about another thing, and John Liu talks about it very well as well, is that there's an enormous amount of, um, uh, of um, vapor that's caught up in the atmosphere. And that vapor has dust in it. And that's why it's not raining. And it acts like a huge blanket. And it's very hard to quantify that. But that is also a major, major effect in global warming is this major vapor blanket that we have sitting mm. there. And um, the way to address that is to rejuvenate our soils. And in the end, that's what this whole process is about, is rejuvenating our soils and bringing moisture back into our soils and making our lives better. I always like to quote somebody who says, heal the soil, heal the people. Mm. You've got, um, you've got cottages on your farm and that as well, if someone wants to come and visit you. Yes, um, my wife runs cottages on the farm and it has really sustained us through this drought and um, COVID has done some damage, but not nearly as much. Our location is very good. And um, that's how we really make a living um, a lot of the time. I mean, it, pre it represents about 50% of our income on the farm. And um, it also allows me a little bit of extra money to do other things with on the farm, improve the farm. And um, yeah, we love having people here. And uh, a lot of people come here as strangers and leave as friends. And um, it's a magical place to come and stay. Yeah, I mean, you, if you really want peace and quiet, you come here. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. This is Mrs. Yamnek's house, this, and um, she raised uh, 12 children in this home and she's buried just the other side of a thorn tree here. And um, she does apparently every now and then come and visit. Um, I've never met her personally, but uh, some people have and uh, they have feelings. Probably have a guilty conscience <laughs> more than anything else. <laughs> yeah, that they, you know, and, uh, that they hear her. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a very magical place. And uh, mm. we have more modern cottages down at the bottom. Mm. Barry, I really want to thank you to give your time to chat to us, to actually t well, talk about yourself and also what you do in that. And I really hope that we can have an impact on some people in the regards what you actually do here. Yeah, I, I think that um, if you want to improve your life, I think this 
is a beginning to change. I think it's very hard for people to change, but I think that uh, if we can just change one person's mind, then we've accomplished a lot. Mm -hmm. But I do see that um, the regenerative group in, Amer in, excuse me, in South Africa is growing very rapidly. Um, you've started this group on uh, Telegram, and I just see how many people are on that, an enormous amount of people. Mm. And there's some really positive feedback. So I think that unequivocally, that regenerative agriculture is the future. Yeah, so do I. I mean, it's um, in the next interviews, actually, on the we're doing with James Pluchnot, and that we, we're really going to talk about restoration pays. Yes. And, that, and it, um, um, he's a financial, uh, what's it, a financial economy, uh, environmental economist. Yeah. And um, very, that's also hopefully going to be very interesting, yes. Yeah, I can't wait to have a look at that. Mm. Thank you so much for coming out here. And uh, mm. it was really an honor to get some feedback from you. And I always say that this is a very lonely job being a mm. regenerative farmer. You can't just drive over to your neighbor. And so it's wonderful to be able to share this with somebody. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing it. Yeah, yeah thank you very yeah, much. Wonderful. Okay. I don't really own this farm. While I'm alive, I'm a custodian of the land here. And it's my responsibility to leave it in a better state than I found it. And if I have accomplished that, then I've really accomplished a lot.